anticipating, I'm fairly confident, some uh, good things already happening in people's lives and what a blessing it is to just hear uh, the simple testimonies, those brief ones that Sue facilitated this morning that would allow us to consider uh, just how much there is this personal uh, working of, uh, of the Lord in our lives as his spirit seeks to do more and more within us. And uh, so I have, have a level of anticipation as I share with you a little bit further this morning. Uh, and it is a great place to be because this is a place designed to be uh, uh, providing a context in which people are encouraged in their faith and stirred in their faith and, and, and built up in their faith. And that's the vital aspect, uh, the connection cable uh, of, that each one of us carries uh, to, to a God who is faithful. So I, I wanted to um, remind folk, uh, again, we've uh, it started off our midweek series on the Wednesday in regards to the identity, the nature and the ministry, the person of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we're off to a good start. If you'd like to join that group, you're most welcome to. It's one of those things that we invite people to come in and out, but ideally, obviously, is to stick the full distance of the six se uh, sessions that we'd share together. But i just highlight that one if you're uh, interested, haven't already got the notes uh, that would be relevant for this Wednesday, then they're available on the back bench there. And also, just a reminder of the time, I got ahead of myself where, by starting at 2.30, and I'd failed to remember that the uh, men's chat uh, um, had very graciously moved their time a little bit earlier so as we could start at three o'clock and I promptly moved it to half past two. So we don't want the men's chat meeting at half past one or otherwise they'll be having lunch together and, uh, rather than afternoon coffee. But that's just a reminder of three o'clock this Wednesday if you would like to be a part of that uh, conversational. It is designed to be conversational. It's designed to be a, a place where we can do uh, in many ways what Sue was facilitating this morning, uh, the the uh, extended opportunity to give expression to those things that the oh Lord is actually working in our lives as we begin to uh, uh, recognize the work of the Spirit and know that ultimately what he's wanting to do is give us a clearer and clearer picture of Jesus who in turn is looking to give us a greater and greater comprehension of the wonder who of, of God the Father. So that's, that's the course that we're setting. Uh, so this morning, with that sense of um, looking forward to this moment, I want to uh, set out to focus very much on that first verse of uh, Hebrews 11. Now, the top part of that particular verse is not cut off simply because that's a graphic you can get on PowerPoint that sort of puts it in a different context. But you know what the first bit says at the top? It says, Faith. Uh, is being sure of that which we hope for and certain of what we do not see. So I want to take a step further from what I shared with you last Sunday in regards to uh, Romans 5. Uh, and I mentioned the fact that when it comes to uh, understanding, comprehending, appreciating uh, the person, the identity, the working of the Holy Spirit, we've got to start somewhere. Uh, and as again, we've realized this morning, whenever you go to start something, everybody's at a different point. So I've chosen to start right there at Romans 5. And it could be said, it could be said fairly, that I've decided to go in the deep end of the pond. Because Romans is the deep end of the pond when it comes to uh, exploring and experiencing and comprehending those things of God that uh, he's really wanting to make as personal and as accessible as possible. But Romans is very theological. It's very deep in, its, in, in, in the line of thinking that it does. Uh, and so I've gone in that deep end. And I started with that verse because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Now, we've been reminded again this morning through the testimony of the Scriptures that when we declare, when, when a person declares in faith, as simple as, faith, uh, as that faith is, as young as that faith is, uh, uh, when we declare that uh, Jesus is Lord, there is a work that takes place. And here's where Romans 5 describes it. He describes it in this way, with a bit of imagery behind it. We declare that Jesus is Lord, 
and the Spirit of God is poured into our lives. Now this particular Wednesday, <clears throat> when we come into our group context, we'll be looking at how the, uh, how the Spirit of God is seen to be at work in the Old Testament. And one of the images that is used in the Old Testament is the one of the uh, testimony of um, uh, Psalm 133. So I'll move through to that. Okay. Move through to acknowledge that in the Old Testament there is this beautiful image in advance, as it might be said. Psalm 133, you've probably heard this uh, quoted in reference to unity within the body of Christ. It's probably relevant to do that as well. But behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It is like precious oil on the beard running down, uh, on, rather, oil on the head running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. And you see this, this glorious picture of, of, of Aaron, you know, and this stuff rolling down all over his body and we're thinking oh yeah right eh? uh, but it was it was it was indicating there was a, there was a there was an external sort of testimony that the that god would be working by his spirit through that priestly role and so it was something that uh, the people could look to aaron uh, and, and know that there would be some evidence of, of clearly god's working in his life now the interesting thing that I wanted to, or the, the connection to that that I wanted to make this morning is that in Romans 5 it talks about not the Spirit of God being poured upon us but into us. See that's really, really significant because there's a risk even in our faith that we're keeping things external. And here's this powerful image now saying the Spirit of God has been poured into you. You own the name of Jesus. You own the name of Jesus and you couldn't do that unless by the ministry of the Holy Spirit anyway. He's the one who makes it clear enough for a person to see in the simple seed of faith that he brings to bear within them that, that they recognise, I can't see the full picture of who Jesus is, but by the grace of God, the Spirit of God enables me to see enough to say, in, my, in who I am, I'm responding to what's been shown to me, and I declare, and the Holy Spirit enables me to declare that Jesus is Lord. And Jesus is not just Lord of my life, as we're again being reminded this morning, he's the Lord of all. And so I'm prepared in the simplicity and the smallness of that seed of faith. I'm, to, I'm prepared to make that declaration. The Holy Spirit enables me to do that. And in order that that seed of faith is now nurtured and grows and, and expands to its fullest capacity... The Spirit of God says, I'll take up residence. I, I, I'm being poured into who you are. And for those who like the imagery of oil, I love it because, you know, you, 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 the good thing about oil is that it has the capacity to soak, to be absorbed in. And that's what the Spirit of God sets to do. The King James Version speaks of that verse in Romans 5. I'll get to the Hebrews passage in a minute. In the, Hebrew, in, in the Romans 5 passage, it is poured, he is poured into our hearts, that beautiful image, the control centre, the engine room, where everything actually moves around and churns around and has the capacity be, to be grinding sand and life be an absolute misery. The Spirit of God says, I'm going to get in there, I'm going to work on every working part of who you are, and I'm going to have it moving smoothly. It's going to be synchronised. And you're going to have every capacity that you're meant to have as a created identity in Christ to fulfil that, to experience that. And so he is poured into us as distinct from over us. Now, the right honourable maths teachers in the front row this morning, which is very helpful, because I introduced to you a word last week from my Greek alphabet, my Greek lectionary, but it's not Greek. It is Latin. Is that right? It is Latin. For those who haven't got a memory that can recall the word, B 
be assured, I can't either. Extrapolate. Okay, so here's my simple little graph, the, the best one that I can find. Can you see it clear enough? You don't need to read the print because the print's not relevant. I'm looking at the graph. All right? Now, already we've been reminded this morning, the starting point in our graph back here in 1801, anybody who's that old, I just reminded you, don't look at the numbers, but it is distracting, isn't it? Anybody here in 1801? Good. Could be a bit nerve-wracking if you were. Uh, okay, so we're, we're talking about this beginning in, in, in our faith relationship with Jesus. The Spirit enables us to make that declaration and then he moves in. So our starting point is sort of, in actual fact, the Holy Spirit's at work before we make that declaration. He's the one that actually brings that awareness of who Jesus is and then builds a picture that's clear enough for us by faith to grasp on to who Jesus is. And then the top point. Anybody tell me what the top point might be? Yeah, we'll go for heaven, shall we? You know, the mansion destiny. Anybody get excited about the mansion destiny? So that's, that's, that's sort of something we're absolutely assured of. But the bit I, I want to talk about is the bit between here and up there. Sorry, Des. I'll just move back on the screen. Is that better? Thank you. Just stay where you are, Peter. Um, so the distance between that, that starting point and that which is, is, is the mansion. All right? That, that can be quite inspiring. And is often presented, is often presented that that is my hope. Is that a, is that a fair thing to say? As, as a Christian, that's something that I'm hoping for, I'm, I'm heading towards. There's a sense of anticipation about that heavenly mansion. I want to suggest to you there's a lot of things to hope for before that, that event. There's a lot of things to hope for. And they're the things, um, like if I, if I uh, drew a straight line graph that says, you start with Jesus down here in 1801, and by 2015, uh, you're in heaven, so to speak. That could be a straight line, but it's not. You and I know that this journey with Jesus, this process, as it were, of taking on Christ's likeness, is not necessarily a straight line. But it is part of that anticipation that we have that whatever happens along the way, that I think as one who shared with us this morning, is that anticipation that whatever is happening is still a part of my preparation for that ultimate destiny. And my ultimate destiny is not the geographical location, it's the transformation. It's the bit that I will actually step into being fully like Christ, fully like Jesus. That's what I anticipate. People draw these glorious pictures of this, you know, this, this castle in the sky, floating on a cloud, and I'm thinking to myself, really? But if I look at Jesus, and I've forgotten who it was said this morning, you fix your eyes on Jesus. It sounded like Marlene. Is that right, Marlene? See, that's my destiny. As a Jesus follower, that's my destiny. To actually have that created image restored and have the fullness of his likeness as my reality, as my full identity. That inspires me. And it also takes me away from this risk of saying, all I've got to do is find a seat in the local church and it's like a bus to heaven. And Jesus says, I'm not into seating down, I'm into walking. Come, follow me. And I'll put you on this path whereby that transformation will be affected. It could be stretchy at different times, but it'll always bring you to that point that in many ways your heart truly desires. So it is. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for the conviction of things not seen. 
the faith bit. Now, you've probably heard this illustration many times. I have. I think it's a neat illustration, but it has an element of inadequacy. But I want to present it to you again. Have you heard this story? Jean-Francois, how do you pronounce his surname? Grevenet, French for Blondin. Blondin was a world famous tightrope walker. Early in 1859, Blondin decided that he would be the first to walk on a tightrope tight rope stretched across Niagara Falls. 1,100 feet long and 160 feet in the air, he began to promote the event around town and the buzz started. Blondin was as good a promoter and entertainer as he was a tightrope walker. The day came for the performance. Blondin didn't disappoint and neither did the residents of the neighbouring towns. There were thousands of people gathered, some to heckle, some to cheer, and some were there just to say that they were there. As Blondin arrived, he gets the crowd worked into a frenzy, and then he jumps on the rope and has a couple of warm-up exercises. Uh, by the way, I'm not going to illustrate this in any form whatsoever this morning. <laughs> All right, just, just so, so I don't want to build up any sense of anticipation about what this clown's going to do this morning. All right, to the crowd's amazement, he doesn't look nearly as stable on the rope as he should. Parts of the crowd begin to jeer and hurl insults and laugh at the guy that is about to fall to his death. Shouts of, this can't be done, you'll never pull this off, blah, blah, blah. The rest, uh, by the way, this is a version of the story. This is, there is a, yeah, another version that's probably even more accurate. The rest of the crowd drew silent, blonde and continued. He grabbed his balancing pole and started down the rope. The entire path across, he seemed to stumble and trip. The entri entire crowd grew quiet, not a peep. As Blondin reached the other side, he knew he had their attention. When they went from dead silence to offering a thunderous applause, the path back was not as uneasy. In other words, he just moved a little bit more confidently. He arrived back to everyone cheering. He had done it, but he wasn't done. He then proceeded to go back and forth five times. He traversed the rope with no pole. Then he took a chair halfway and sat on the chair. You can picture this, can't you? Anybody been to Niagara Falls? Great idea. Step out on a cable, 160 feet up in the air, put a little chair there and just sit there. Yeah, right, okay. Then he took a chair halfway, sat and, and had a spell. Then he took some juggling pins and juggled all the way across. Then he took a hot plate and made himself lunch. With every trip, the crowd got later. For the last trip, he turned the notch up. A wheelbarrow was revealed. He proceeded to walk the wheelbarrow filled with potatoes across the cable. The crowd cheered, and there was no doubt in his ability to move it across. Blondin then quieted the crowd, and you could hear a pin drop. And he asked for a volunteer to ride in the wheelbarrow across Niagara Falls. Silence. The crowd had seen him in action. They believed him, but they didn't trust him, at, well, at least not with their own lives. Eventually, it is said, his manager, some accounts say it was his mother, jumps in and they both make the trip just as easily as he did with the potatoes in the barrow. Ta-da! It's a great illustration, but it does fall short when uh, you look at details because in no way is Jesus asking me to walk on a cable 160 feet in the air over Niagara Falls. But he is looking for that level of trust in his identity and what he has proven, what he has evidenced, what he has already completed. That particular illustration, I know, has been used extensively in the Alpha series and has proved to be quite a point of consideration for people listening. It is also the, the, the whole 
I suppose the whole idea, the concept of trusting is something that has also come in the forms of songs. We've sung some this morning and I hope that as I mentioned last week and probably weeks before that you might be conscious of actually what you're saying. Because as we are conscious of what we're saying, one of, the, one of the ways that the Spirit of God brings an awareness of the presence of God is in what we are declaring, as Sue shared this morning. I am trusting, you can appreciate the old language because we're talking 18 something or another. I'm trusting thee, Lord Jesus, trusting only thee. Trusting thee for full salvation, great and free. I'm trusting thee for pardon, at thy feet I bow, for thy grace and tender mercy, trusting now. I'm trusting thee for cleansing in the crimson flood, trusting thee to make me holy by thy blood. I am trusting thee for power, thine can never fail. Uh, words which thou thyself shalt give me must prevail. I'm trusting thee, Lord Jesus, never let me fall. I'm trusting thee forever. And for all, Francis Havergal. Inspiring. Indeed. It was the testimony of that woman's life. We're going to sing in a little while another song. Blessed Assurance, the one that perhaps many of us are familiar with. Written by this lady. Who many would know was actually blind. Wrote hundreds of hymns. This is perhaps the best known one. But the testimony that that song speaks so loudly and clearly of was the testimony of the Spirit of God within her. Truly it is powerful. And I guess in some ways as I focused quite specifically on just that one verse that so many of us are familiar with, that I trust, again, it's a refresher, it's a realisation, that my starting point with Jesus was faith. My continuing point with him is faith. And the person of the Holy Spirit is determined for that, that faith to be exercised, to be strengthened, to be expanding, to be influencing, to be impacting people's lives around. That is the course that Jesus calls us on. faith. Starting point, sustaining point. It is the point that actually hooks us into the faithfulness of God. Because God is always true to his word. He's always true. And you know there, I'm not just referring to the printed word. What was the title that, uh, that John, one of the close disciples of Jesus, how did, how did he describe Jesus he, as he began his narrative? The word became flesh, person, personal, accessible, understandable, believable, trustworthy. It opens up before us. Faith stirs, not just an expansion of faith, but it stirs hope, anticipation, the Hitchcocks lent me their dog for the morning. But it's a beautiful picture, isn't it? I wonder if somebody took a snapshot of you right now that it would look something like, I've got anticipation. And it shows on my face. And in some ways, if I take the dog analogy a little bit further, you can see the lead in my mouth saying, Lead me, Lord. Holy Spirit, lead me. I have anticipation. A positive, realistic anticipation. And I mention realistic because Jesus gave his disciples a realistic set of, a sense of anticipation. Of expectation. That's why he speaks Matthew 16. If you're going to follow me, there's a cost factor. That's pretty earthy, isn't it? 
It's not just a matter of follow me. I've got you this massive mansion and you wouldn't believe the plumbing system in this place and the mirrors and you wouldn't believe what's in the kitchen. Now he says, I, I, I've, I've got this, this life journey for you and I want you to walk it with a sense of anticipation that I will continue to be shaping your life into what it's destined to be. So that when you do actually get to the step out point or the graduation point at the end of your earthly journey, you are as prepared as you possibly could be to enter into that awesome context, whatever it looks like. Philippians 1 talks about that conviction it's a really interesting word that's used in this particular translation, the ESV. And we often think that conviction, yes, the Spirit of God does convict us. But in this context, it's used in such a way that it's speaking about the Spirit of God, that this faith that he's, he's looking to nurture and stretch and build, this sense of anticipation that's focused very much about the personal transfer, transformation bit. And he says, now the Spirit of God is he's going to give you clarity about what's going on. You will be able to actually see what he's doing. You know, where it's, it's often said that faith is something that you don't, you don't need to see things. But because of our relationship with Jesus and the work of the Spirit, we are able to see things that we did not see before. So if I put it back up there again, this is just another, um, oh, sorry, that's the, the clarity, the clarity that the Spirit of God will uh, allow us to see. For example, the, perhaps the most common phrase that people might use in the context of prayer, and I know I use it quite regularly. And Jesus said, as his disciples asked him to, so Lord, teach us to pray. And he says, okay, pray in this fashion. Our Father in heaven, holy be your name. Thy kingdom come. What does that look like? And literally, by the grace of God, and this working of the Spirit in our faith, and that sense of anticipation, he gives clarity to what that looks like and how, how it works in our own personal life circumstances which I, I, I think is quite amazing and it is something that comes purely out of faith so now faith is the substance of things we hope for the evidence the seeing of things that we've not seen before now I do like to wherever possible and I'll prepare Margie at this point of time because I'm going to use an illustration that she doesn't necessarily. David Attenborough. Has that turned everybody off? No? Good. Stick with me, John. Um, I can't agree with David Attenborough's philosophy on life and all that sort of stuff. But that's not what I'm on about. I don't mind observing what he discovers. This is the Green Planet, and I watched uh, a part of it uh, during the week. And uh, photography is amazing. And at length, this elderly gentleman, now into his mid-90s, I think, explains how they're able to get these pictures that your eye and my eye cannot see. Can you see where I'm going? Faith will allow you to see things that you'd never seen before. And people not necessarily carrying that faith can see it. It's part of the challenge of communicating the faith to a person who doesn't have faith. How do I do that? Well, this particular illustration helps me. And I don't mind actually quoting this context. See the equipment there? 
And this is part of what David Attenborough uh, explained a couple of weeks ago. It's got two cameras. One of them picks up what the human eye can see. One of them picks up, heat. it's a heat sensor or a life sensor. It picks up things that our eyes don't see. So what happens is eventually what you and I see on the television is two pictures blended together. And it brings out stuff that we would never actually see. And I was sitting there fascinated as they show this picture of a fish. And because of the lenses being used, you could see the fish and said, oh yeah, that looks like a fish. And then they bring in this other camera and you see that this fish has got headlights because it picked up the light sensors that we normally wouldn't pick up. And so there's this fish on the bottom of the ocean going around with driving lights. Now, you do what you like with David Attenborough, but I'm not sure. I think I'd probably be bold enough if I ever met him in a conversation. I could say to him, that was an amazing discovery that you've made with those cameras. Do you know that faith enables you to see what God's doing? I don't know what he'll say. But the point being for me is that faith actually gives you the capacity to see exactly what life is. Hopefully you can catch on to that. Anyway, bear with me for a moment. I just want to finish up this. Oh, I should have finished some moments ago. Um, last Sunday morning, and I want to share these with you just with a little comment. Because, again, as Sue's reminded us this morning, the Lord just sort of gets our attention in a whole variety of ways. And at the end of last um, Sunday morning, and we were singing that final song, and I felt, Lord, are you just going to show me a couple of things here? Because that's what he tends to do from time to time. So I want to share with you what he showed me. He showed me that. I've used it this morning quite deliberately. If, if you've got a set of glasses, don't you need both eyes? You mean a pair of glasses? Do we need just the one lens? Leave that one with you. That one? What does that trigger in people as you see it? Nothing? Give me oil in my lamp, keep me burning. Everybody else did it this morning, so I'll have a go as well. You know, there's this, just, just this reminder that we can, we can ask and we can keep on asking for that good work that only the Holy Spirit of God can do within us. Now, this one was particularly significant. And the Lord said, that's not exactly the picture, but it's pretty close to what I felt the Lord just showed me. And he gave me the words keep drilling down. Now that one's got a name next to it. This just to give you an idea of just how the Lord works sometimes, just connecting the dots. I rang a friend, I texted a friend during the week, said, hey Andrew, we've been trying to get up, get together and have a cup of coffee for ages. How about we do it? So he got back, he says, actually I'm in Victor on Friday. And anyway, we finished up having lunch. Do you know what he said three times in that conversation? keep drilling down. Peculiar, isn't it? Now, you don't have to worry about that. That's me. I've got to work with that. But again, it's this uh, personal working of the Spirit of God in our lives. And then he showed me this picture. And the word came. Evidence of a harvest forming. So my little exercise of faith, I've heard Hebrews 11.1 1, approximately 763 times. Probably more than that. It's just a number in my head. But it's when it starts to work, when it continues to work, when the Spirit of God says faith is, that's the material I love to work with. 
So as we sing together now, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. We make a direct connection that yes, Jesus is with me. And by his spirit, he's out to make my faith work to its maximum capacity every day that he gives me to the glory of God. Amen.